Hello, I'm Gemma Agrillo, a conductor and a composer, and welcome back for another video of Conducting Fields, a series where we analyze a repertory piece, or part of it, from the conductor's point of view. This week is a turn of the first movement of Mahler's Second Symphony. You can jump to different sections of this video by clicking on the links below in the description. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Now, Mahler originally composed the first movement of his second symphony as a symphonic poem titled Totenfeind. The symphonic poem was a particularly popular form in that time. Just think about the symphonic poems of Pika Strauss. In writing to fellow composer and journalist Max Marschalk, Mahler comments on the first movement of the symphony with these words. Why did you live? Why did you suffer? Is it all nothing but a huge frightful joke. He would eventually give his own answer to these questions in the last movement of the symphony. It took Mahler around six years to write his second symphony. Totenfire became the first movement of the symphony, but Totenfire is a funeral march, which is a very awkward place to start because that's usually where things end. However, Mahler made it very clear in a number of occasions that the hero, the triumphs, in the first symphony is the same one that we are now mourning here. As he said, and I quote, the real climactic end of the first symphony comes in the second. Now, let's listen to the end of the first symphony and to the beginning of the second symphony back to back. The opening of the movement is striking, but despite the gigantic orchestration of the entire symphony, Mahler here only calls for violins and violas, in fortissimos and tremolos, while the cellos and basses burst in on the second bar. If there is one thing that you need to conduct Mahler in a certain way is the independence of the two hands. And you can start here right at the beginning, for instance using your left hand for the upper strings and your right hand for the lower strings. Mahler was exceptionally detailed in his course, often addressing conductors themselves. And here's what he outlines in the first few bars of this movement. A written out explanation next to the tempo indication, which is Allegro Maestoso, that reads, with a quite serious and solemn expression. The cello and basses are marked as wild. And the footnote is for the conductor. In the first few bars of the theme, the bass figures are to be played quickly and in a violent rush, with a quarter equal to 144. The rests, however, should be performed at a quarter 84 to 92. The fermata is short, as if it were a swing back to regain new strength. After the first few bars, the cellos and basses end this episode with a rhythmic cell that forms the base for the entire movement. They calm down in dynamics and use this very same cell as an accompaniment for this funeral march, which is played by the oboe and the English horn. The dynamic is piano, but notice the wedges on the notes asking for the weight on the sound that Mahler is really looking for. And take note of the register in which the oboes are playing. It's the lowest register, making the sound very dark and kind of threatening. To keep the piano dynamic, Mahler calls for both oboes in unison. Everyone else is playing other pianissimo, double P, or three Ps. Strictly adhering to the dynamics will take care of balance, at least up to a certain point. But there are so many things going on that as a conductor you will have to rely on your ability to multitask. Four bars after number one, for example, the woodwinds have a diminuendo, while the violins have a crescendo. Two hands, two different gestures. 
Shortly before number two, we have the certainty that our hero is dead. The first outburst of the entire orchid. But we're immediately taken to a totally different section. The second theme is already here, in the very foreign key of E major, in all his calmness, played by the violins and four horns, while the bass line plays with the menacing triplets we've heard so much of in the previous section. Notice a couple of common elements between the two themes. The first interval is a fourth, just like the cello and basses itself, and this theme begins with a scale. Now, a scale is also the ending part of the opening. As noted on the scores, the clarinets should only be an echo, which automatically gives more weight to the horns line. The horns are also marked very clear, seven bars, after number three. The serenity of this passage only lasts a few bars when it's torn into pieces by the scream of the violence, which takes us back to the wars of the beginning. Apparently, we're back at square one. Well, not quite, we already heard the musical material, so Mahler plays with it in a sort of mini-development. The rage outbursts and calms down in these typical Mahler gestures of contrasting emotions. The harps lead the transition to the reiteration of the second theme, but before that I want to point out another remark that the composer makes for the conductor. The double basses go down to a low D. Normally double basses come with four or five strings, to reach the very low C. But not all basses in the orchestra have the fifth string or the extension, and Mahler was perfectly aware of it, so this is what he writes on the score. If there are not at least two double basses with the C string, then two basses must tune to the E string down to D. Playing the missing notes an octave higher, as it is sometimes done, is not to be tolerated here. One bar before number five, the horn should be slightly more prominent than the woodwinds because they bridge with the rest of the brass at number five. Seven bars after number five, make sure that the violins play with a lot of bow and not too short. The second theme comes back, again emerging out of a dominant pedal, in a different key, C major this time, and with different orchestration. And then something new happens. The English horn plays a kind of pastoral theme, a connection to nature that Muller loved so dearly. Right at number eight, make sure that the accents in the second violins are only vibrato and not actual violent accents. This bucolic moment fades away as the cello and basses go back to a rhythm that's closer to the ones in the opening. The English horn and bass clarinet play a new theme. The development of this section ends with a climax with a big fortissimo with three Fs. After which, we're taken back to the second theme once again, played this time by a solo flute accompanied by the harps, while the first violins are in tremolo and the cello plays a trill on the dominant. It's a fantastic creative orchestration on Mahler's side. The oboe enters as well as a solo violin. And everything is, here is kind of light-hearted, in full contrast with the erupting and disrupting feelings of the previous section. This could very well be the development section of the entire movement. The themes are presented intertwined with all the other musical ideas. Everything is moving in different directions, sometimes together, sometimes collapsing. There's a change of the orchestration and, of course, there's a change of the energy. But is it? Or is it, in fact, just a third exposition? 
See, Mahler is tearing down the fabric of the symphonic world as we know it up until that point. Of course, he has a plan to see through, and the plan will be revealed throughout the entire movement. As a conductor, of course, you need to know the plan right from the beginning so that you actually know where you're going. But again, starting from the big picture and working down the details should do the trick. And so the outburst of the beginning comes back abruptly, sort of reminding us that that oasis of calmness we just heard was but the illusion of a moment. The strings come back and the silence in between their parts is filled by low woodwinds and brass on top of tam-tam and timpani. The outburst lasts only 10 bars and we're taken back to another development section. The cello and basses play an accompaniment that comes from the previous material. The English horn reminds us of the color of the funeral march at the beginning of the movement. Muller tells the conductor to start at the slow tempo and very slowly work his or her way up without rushing. This is so very difficult. Trumpet and trombone play a duet while the flute and the oboe counterpoint with, again, previous material, either in its original form or in an inversion of it. Three bars before number 17, make sure to bring out the fourth and fifth horn, nicely paired with the violas, especially on the last beat of the bar, where their duplets will increase the tension playing against the triplets of the violins. There's a tremendous build-up spurring from this material. And at the climax, Mahler stops with a comma. And then restarts. And then stops again. And then everything breaks loose. We sink into darkness with a reiteration of the musical materials that seem unable to find a way out of themselves. The brass put a stop to the development with the molto pesante part. And then the entire orchestra ends with an unequivocal gesture. It's not over yet. Timpani and violas keep the roll and the tremolos and we're taken into the recapitulation. Everything here is condensed, shortened in comparison to the exposition. On the third and fourth bar of number 22, make sure to ask for more weight from the horns, especially on the trill. Give a sharp and clear upbeat to get a crystal resolution of the trill in the following bar. And notice the difference in dynamics compared to number two. There is no diminuendo in the woodwinds here. And then we come to an end. Somber and threatening descending scales played by the cello, basses and harps lay the ground to the funeral horns. Everything smells of death here. There is no hope left, except for a moment where we land on a C major. That doesn't last long, and in what became somewhat of a Mahler fingerprint, we go back from major to minor. The entire world collapses with the orchestra's cascading scale. And then there are just two bars that reduce the orchestration to timpani and string pizzicatos and pianissimo. The hero is dead, and there's nothing left. And in the score, Mahler asks for five entire minutes of silence before beginning the following movement. Now imagine that, a conductor is staying there for five entire minutes. It's an eternity, just waiting for the music to sink in, in silence. 
you learn something new from today's video, then make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below this video. But now I want to turn it over to you. What fascinates you the most? Is it the gargantuan scale of this movement? Is it its orchestration? Is it the drama of the hero's death? Or perhaps this translucent phrase of hope? Either way, let me know in the comment below left right now, and I will see you next week with a new video on Beethoven's Coriolan Overture. Till then, bye bye. Hello, I'm John Grillo. I'm looking uh, by clicking on the links. Nya, 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 nya. As he said, as I. Uh, the second theme comes back. Again, again, again. Cut! <laughs>